Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for Service Delivery, When is the Right Time to Deploy Your AI? Presented by Information Management Today and Information Technology Zone and sponsored by Freshworks and Rightstar. I'm Michelle, the Webinar Coordinator of Information Management Today and Information Technology Zone. And I'm excited to bring you this webinar featuring expert speakers, Dick Stark and Casey Steenport, who are going to, be, who are going to bring you their hard earned insight about when you should deploy AI and how it can be used to empower your organization's service management. Today, we will be recording this webinar in case you have to leave early. We are sending the link to the landing page in the chat box right now. Up next, before we go any further, I wanna thank Freshworks and Rightstar for sponsoring this webinar and helping us to make this happen. Rightstar is a leading ITSM, ITIL, and Lean Agile DevOps consultancy and Freshworks solution provider. They provide best-in-class service, desk implementation through consulting focused on configuration, integration, and training. They also provide DevOps and application lifecycle management, consulting, and advisory services. Freshworks provides innovative customer engagement software for businesses of all sizes, making it easy for teams to acquire, close, and win customers for life. The Freshworks cold cloud-based suite of products is designed to work tightly together to increase collaboration and help teams work better teams better connect and communicate with their customers and coworkers. The products provide a 360 degree view of the customer, are ready to go, easy to use and offer a quick return on investment. Thanks again, Rightstar and Freshworks. Up next, let's go ahead and get some technical things out the way. Please feel free to ask questions during today's session. You can do so by submitting them into the questions panel on the right side of your screen. My lovely colleague, Rebecca, will be fielding your questions today. She'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So pull up the questions panel and say hello to let her know that you are listening. Lastly, if you have any audio issues during today's presentation, you may wish to choose to dial in by phone. You can do so by selecting the more button in the right upper right portion of your screen and then select the switch to switch to phone option. Up next, today I'm talking to Dick Stark and Casey Steenport. Dick is president and founder of Rightstar Inc. His passion is customer success, whether it's reducing the cost of service management, improving overall efficiency, or increasing end user or employee satisfaction. Dick brings Rightstar more than 25 years of experience in building, managing, and operating technology companies, and over 35 years of total experience in the technology industry. And Casey Steenport leads a group of high-performing solution engineers at Freshworks in Denver, Colorado. He spent 15 plus years in technology, combining his passion for tech with a desire to help businesses transform their customer experience strategies. He's had a multitude of roles across the SaaS customer experience space, including as an implementation engineer, principal solution consultant, and now he is an SE leader at notable customer-centric businesses such as Bizarre Voice, Marketo, Zindex, and Box. Now that I've introduced you all to our esteemed speakers, without further ado, take it away, Dick and Casey. Great, uh, Michelle, as we go to the next slide, um, I would love to put a poll question out there for everybody. We can get that started. Absolutely. There we go. All right. So for this poll here, we have, is your organization looking to introduce AI or bot solution into your service DEX processes? Wow, we have an equal amount right now. Ooh, right now we have all three of them are options. Let's see, with 29%, that is amazing. Oh, now we have a leading one for this last one here. We are considering, but it's on, but it's on competing list of priorities. I'm going to leave this poll up for about five more seconds in. So go ahead and get your answers in. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for participating there. So for the results, what we're seeing here is that the top answer was we are considering, but it's not on um, the, that third answer there. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that um, I'm sure Dick's seen this too. It's it, it's not that it's from lack of wanting, it's more, okay, well, how do we uh, prioritize it? How do we actually implement this in a way that starts from a crawl, walk, run standpoint, um, in a way that's impactful for employees and obviously the uh, help desk agents will be using it day to day. Um, so yeah, well, maybe we can help uh, 
get folks more into the first or second choices uh, after we get through this discussion today. Um, again, yeah, nice to meet everybody. I'm Casey Steenport, um, leading a group of solution engineers here at Freshworks uh, in Denver, Colorado. Um, beyond CX, um, been very heavily involved in the ITSM space as well, but more importantly, have had a passion around AI technologies, ML, and NLP uh, for several years. And that has led me to be able to take that information, take that experience, and apply it to almost whatever technology uh, or use case I'm working in. Uh, on the side, uh, I am a beekeeper on the side. It's my first year doing it, and uh, you know, it's um, been, been a joy to kind of have that as a hands-on uh, thing to do as a hobby on the side, uh, especially during COVID. And being a Colorado, and of course, I am always up in the mountains doing some hiking and backpacking. So let's go ahead and just dive right in. Real quick about Freshworks, just so you understand who we are. Um, we started out as a customer service platform originally in 2010, known as Freshdesk. Had amazing growth since then. You may have seen this in the news recently about some certain upcoming events. I will say nothing else about that because we are in a quiet period, but exciting times in the, in the future for us. Um, for today, what's interesting uh, or, or more relevant is more around, I'm sorry, I hit too, uh, next too early, it is more around um, our fresh service product. So what we found is customers were using our customer service platform for internal IT help desk. And we decided instead of them using a CX purpose-built solution for employee experience, why don't we go ahead and purpose-built build a ITIL-aligned ITSM platform that's similar in feel, but has more of the ITSM um, functionality in it, and that became Fresh Service. Um, it's our second largest product um, with over $100 million in, in recurring ARR every year, uh, and that's what we'll more refer to today when we talk about different AI technologies. Um, that may be uh, of relevance to the, the audience. So really, when you, when you think about, just in general, what a CIO's pain points are today, especially in a COVID-type world where more people are remote, there's a lot of competing strategies around wanting to do more with less, which, bas which basically means you can't just throw bodies at the problem, right? We have to be able to make agents and, and help desk agents more efficient, we have to help employees um, self-serve or at least uh, go down the correct request path, depending on whether it's a change or an incident or a problem of some sort. Um, we need to do that in a way that's intentful, uh, is efficient, and hopefully drives a high level of self-service and uh, agent efficiency. Uh, we also know because everyone is remote, right, uh, the, the demand for getting the right device getting access to VPN and all of the fun little things that happen day to day are much more complex when you can't just go over to your IT help desk in the office and ask them for some help. Um, you also need to manage workload, right? Your, your agents uh, across the globe who are all working remote as well, your, your IT, IT team need to be able to know what requests are coming in, what's occurred, who needs to answer it and make it personalized. Uh, so that's really why we're talking today is how can we solve for all these problems at the same time doing it in a way that hopefully leverages AI and bots. So the key takeaways I want you to, to, to get from this full presentation by the end is why essentially AI and ML are here to stay. Um, they are the way of the future. Um, but then how can you take AI and ML strategies and use it to transform your employee experience? It's not just about adding these as new tools in the, in, the, in the toolbox, essentially. It's making it part of an employee journey in a way that's intentful and easy to use and delightful. This was a really interesting stat I saw recently um, that by next year at this point, 70% of employee interactions will probably involve some level of hyper automation, learning, virtual agents, or some kind of predictive analytics. Um, the reason for that, again, is we really want to get to the point of being much more efficient. We want employees to get the answers they want in, in a delightful way. And we want your help desk and your service desk to work on interesting problems and work on uh, less of the, the repeat questions that come in day, in day in and day out because we know there's almost a 3x chance that they're going to um, leave the company within a year if all they do is the same mundane tasks over and over. But what is the difference between AI, ML, bots, natural language processing, right? There's so many terms out there. Um, really, AI is more about the science uh, of 
the, 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 the vertical essentially. So uh, the, the mathematics essentially behind everything, whether it's um, some kind of numerical vertice or an algorithm or a, a program, it's all about taking a lot of data and identifying patterns and then uh, automatically changing behavior based on that. Machine learning is just a subset of that, which basically um, means providing systems um, the ability to automat automatically learn based on that data and then improve from experience without being explicitly told to from a programming standpoint. So that, that could be the algorithms, that could be uh, some kind of pattern recognition, usually requires quite a bit of data, um, whether within your own systems or across a more global data set. Uh, but the goal is, again, how can we take all these different points of data, identify certain uh, uh, trends or uh, repeat patterns, and then how can we automatically change the behavior of something, usually some kind of program, without a human having to get involved. And then a bot is just a front-end or back-end software program that executes those commands, that replies the messages, or automatically creates a new service request within Slack or MS Teams, or auto-triages and routes a, re a request to a specific help desk agent based on the request type and, and who's asking it and where they're located. Um, it's just the 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 the, the face, I guess you could say, uh, of this technology. And really, uh, if you really want to uh, improve or transform your, your employee experience today, you can, you can use AI and ML in many ways. Basically, there's three personas that you're going to interact with, and we'll talk about how we can deploy um, various technologies for each one, but there's essentially how can we transform the employee experience for the employee, right? How do we make it easy for them to do their jobs by providing them the, a quick answer to an IT related question, to get them access to a specific asset they need in a way that's very proactive or efficient? How can we make it very delightful for them to interact with your ITSM groups? Your help desk agent, agents, it's all about more about taking out the mundane work, right? Not having to, to answer the same questions about Here's how you connect the VPN. Here's how you reset your AD password, whatever it might be, right? Um, it's about improving productivity and making it much more likely for them to be champions for your employees by identifying, hey, I've noticed new request types coming in that are, are a trend, or I have specific tribal knowledge and I want to leverage that to improve our EX um, experience overall. Those are the things a more productive and happy uh, service desk agent can, uh, can achieve if they're not working on mundane tasks over and over. And then for your CIOs, for your head of IT, for anyone else who wants to understand what's being asked, how can we improve our processes? Your AI and ML technologies are integrated to the rest of your ITSM strategies, can help you create those actionable insights and actually build a better, more efficient and predictable business over time. So this is actually one of our philosophies, whether it's for customer experience or employee experience. It's about taking both the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence and making it a place where uh, you can augment your human workers and make their work more impactful and more enjoyable, make it more likely to be satisfied employees. So the other thing you'll, you'll remember, and, and, and this should be hopefully really straightforward to most folks nowadays, especially being remote, is it's not always easy to ask for, a make a request. You don't know where to go. Where is our service catalog? Um, can I ask for help from IT and submit a request via whatever collaboration channels I use today, like Slack or MS Teams? Like, uh, is my license for a specific piece of software about to expire? Uh, that is all stuff I, as an employee, as, I mean, I work in sales, right? I don't wanna have to worry about that. I want my experience to be effortless when I need to make a request, I need access to a new VPN, or I need access to a new office now that we're slowly starting to open up. That should be personalized based on where I'm at, but should be easy as well without any kind of wait time. There's a lot of good uh, sources around this, and we're um, happy to provide um, some reports around this, but 1%, which is blows my mind, 1% of employees feel that help desk consistently meets their expectations. There's almost always some experience that you have as an employee reaching out to your service desk um, when you need to make a request, you need to make some kind of change, you need to make a purchase where the hoops that you go through, the, the research you have to do to go figure out where you ask that uh, is, is frustrating, frankly. Um, employees demand better. They prefer to sell service if they can, whether that's via some kind of uh, service catalog or a knowledge base article 
or a virtual agent that can handle the request for them. It's much easier than having to pick up the phone. Um, they expect uh, IT support and company, company collaboration channels. So again, the Slack, the MS Teams, uh, actually uh, Freshworks recently um, added a new, what we call Lighthouse Bot to our, um, to our Slack channels that allow me to very quickly submit a request or even approve requests for my employees um, without ever having to leave the channel that I prefer. Really, really nice. Uh, we've noticed that the response time for, especially for approval requests, have gone up by about 50% just by putting it within Slack. Um, and then obviously, right, we're in a, a COVID a pandemic world right now. Um, there's a ton of volume right now for help desk requests. People who are going remote, people who are coming back from the office. You need to find a way to leverage AI and ML or any other kind of like hyper automation to improve the efficiency of your existing help desk agents without having to massively bloat your IT budget because you have to throw a bunch of bodies at the problem. So let's talk about the three strategies from an employee, help desk or service desk, and a, a leadership standpoint, how you can incorporate and improve your processes using AI and ML. So one is just called zero contact resolution. It just means make it really easy for the employee to find an answer, um, resolve a problem, get a request in, and do it in a way that hopefully you can in increase deflection rates so that, you, again, your uh, help desk is focused on more uh, impactful work, to say the least. So I'm going to come back to this slide a few times, but you can kind of see there's a whole timeline, right, of ways that AI can interact with employees, help desk, service desk agents, and then analytics and, um, and leadership. So we'll kind of go through this one by one. But the employee facing is all about engaging and deflecting, essentially, meaning I should be able to work with some kind of um, uh, virtual agent uh, in Slack, an email, an MS Teams, where I can send in a question, it can give me an answer, or, or if it detects my intent, from there, create an actual service request from that process. Make it seamless and easy, and your employees will use it, which again is a big part uh, of the question, right? How do they adopt it? How do we get people to actually use this technology? Put it where they're gonna work, okay? And then make sure to follow up with uh, these answers with some kind of intent-based bot conversation that essentially engages with them to understand, did this answer your question? Do you have follow-up questions? How can we improve? To continually build that life cycle and that, that cyclical feedback loop that improves all your processes overall. Okay, so we'll start with that. And why is it that we need we need that? One, because help desk agents need that help. Again, with all these uh, additional requests, everyone being remote, people coming back into the office now, uh, we don't want to have a bunch of busy work. We want to be more productive with the work that we can do without, without again, uh, throwing a lot of uh, extra budget at it. So employees without AI have basically said uh, that they spend most of the time working on mundane tasks. So think about, again, uh, if I have to work on very specific asset management type requests or a service request of some sort, um, those are standard processes that occur over and over and over. AI and, and ML technologies, like Freshworks, but many others, can help you with streamlining those processes and automating them so that, again, I can just focus on, do I approve this? Do I need to go and approve, a, 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 approve some kind of new process or even suggest a new process based on what I'm seeing and not focus on these simple requests that come in? The other thing what we're really seeing, uh, and, and one of the things that Fresh Service is really great about solving for is just that burnout, both again from an end user uh, employee standpoint and from an agent standpoint, right? Um, you don't want to work on the same task going over and over. You want to feel like your work matters uh, and is intentional, especially, right? You know, work and real life kind of blend together right now when everyone's working from home. So how can we make the work that they do more engaging? So that's why we want to focus second on the hyper automation, which is more, okay, a request has come in. Um, what do we do with that in a way to, again, make that work more engaging and hopefully make everyone more efficient? So let's automate those repetitive tasks, make people happy. So there's a bunch of steps along this way. And again, there's a lot of technologies out there. I, I won't speak to just Freddy, which is our AI technology uh, around this, but I, I highly recommend you investigate and compare a few together and see which one works best. But part of it is, as you're uh, ramping new help desk agents, especially the longer we stay remote and people have to get hired and start to support either a new location or region or just backfill 
uh, attrition. Um, how do you onboard those 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 help desk and service desk agents quickly and efficiently? You can use AI to do that. That might just mean something as simple as uh, an agent assist bot that walks me through some branching logic that I answer some questions and it guides me to here's the process you need to follow for this specific request type. Very simple, but it helps uh, agents build that muscle memory. Uh, it makes it so they don't have to go to some kind of uh, repository of MS Word docs to find the right document, open it up, follow the process in there, put it in your help desk uh, tools to make sure that they can be guided through any new process that they're doing. Again, we talk about the uh, virtual agent, allow them to create a ticket from there. Think about think about uh, how you probably interacted with IT in the past, whether it's via a web chat or some kind of like work chat, like a, a chatter, Teams, Slack, Google Hangouts, when that was a thing still, whatever it might be. You probably reached out to some IT person that you happen to know. Uh, you, you hopefully have a little in with them or you've made a connection with them in the past. So you disregard any process that you should follow, like sending a ticket within the portal or something. You message them, hey, I need to get a new laptop. I spilled a drink on mine on my last flight. What do I do? What does that agent do? They go, okay, go to the portal and submit this request. They'll go through this huge process. You'll have to, your boss will have to approve it. We'll have to make sure we have an inventory, yada, yada, right? Um, what if instead in that channel, when, uh, when they ask the IT agent, hey, how do I get a new device? The IT agent could, could just kick off the process based on the conversation within that collaboration channel. That's what a lot of tools like, again, Freddie, can do today out of the box, which is really, really impactful because that's where your employees are going to spend most of the time anyway. It's from a collaboration standpoint. As you get more and more of that volume in, a good AI and all technologies is going to be able to identify common themes and auto triage certain request types. Whether again it's some kind of incident like an outage or some kind of alert management, kick off kicked off some kind of process or alert, um, or a request for a new employee, for example, right? Onboarding a new employee, you almost always follow the same steps. Got to get them in, into into the payroll. I've got to get a uh, a W-2 going, I've got to give them a device. If they're in an office, I got to assign them a desk, right? Those are common processes. A good AI technology can auto triage a request and auto kick off those processes. And then the number six, in the case that it doesn't necessarily know exactly what to do next, it should be able to suggest a next best answer or a next best step that tells me, okay, based on what I'm seeing, I think this is the next best step. Do you want to follow it? And give the agent the autonomy to decide whether to follow it or not. And then even things like RPA, if you've looked at RPA, that's really taking off as a way to actually execute backend processes. Great example might be uh, offboarding uh, um, a, a, a former employee, for example. There's a process you follow there, but you've got to ex execute processes in other systems like an HR system, HRIS, uh, payroll, whatever, right? Um, you have to send something off to COBRA, so COBRA sends them a letter to let them know that uh, they can continue to have insurance if they enroll in that program, uh, whatever it might be. The bots, actually a good bot technology via RPA can initiate those backend processes from a, a help desk screen without having to go to those systems. Um, so whatever solution you look at, highly suggest you look at one that can do all of these um, instead of getting different technologies that can do one for employee facing, one for agent facing, and one for analytics. All right, number three, right? We've got to focus on how do we optimize this. It's not it's not enough to just put this in the employee flow, uh, their user journeys, I guess you could say. It's not enough to deflect requests, hyper automate them. You've got to optimize over time. Businesses change, uh, people expect uh, AI to change with it and adapt and provide the insights to leadership to decide what should we do next? Are we getting a good effort score? Are we getting an easy effort score, I guess you could say, from our employees? Are our help desk agents happy with using this? Those are things you can measure over time. And then again, a good technology will suggest, hey, you should initiate this automation or this process or this article even from a deflection standpoint in the future to improve uh, and streamline your processes and make things even more efficient. So I won't go through each one of these um, to make sure we have enough time here, but um, we do know that the use of AI by help, by help desk teams is projected to increase 143%. You, you, if you remember earlier, the, the 2022 quote about 
of businesses expecting to use some kind of AI technology by the end of next year. Um, it's growing quick, right? It's almost an expectation now. Um, I, I've talked a little bit about how do you make it more intentional? How do you put it where the employees will use it? And how do you make it easy for a help desk agent to utilize it? But now you need to make sure to continue to improve that process. So service leaders already should be using AI in, in EX, um, or they're gonna plan to do it so in the next year. So make sure you have one that can give you some kind of feedback on, is this actually working? What's our adoption percentage? And then what can we do to improve this process over time? Again, that cyclical feedback loop. We do know that leaders also need help op optimizing AX. Um, uh, actually, Dick and I were just talking a little bit before uh, this, this webinar about how do you actually get it out there in a way that's meaningful and adoptable by employees and, and help desk agents? Um, a good tool is gonna give you that feedback, again, by giving you those insights um, and giving you the actionable insights, I guess you say, without having to go and build these reports over and over. So whatever solution you use, I highly recommend that it seamlessly feeds into whatever broader ITSM, ITIL aligned analytical tool that you use. So if you're using a fresh service or you're using a service now or something else, whatever it might be, this AI technology should pump into that analytics tool to give you a more holistic view into how is AI and ML and hyper automation improving all of our processes? How is it making employees happier? How is it making agents uh, more engaged with the solution? If AI and ML technologies are sitting on top of it and are separate, they're never gonna, you're never gonna have that holistic end-to-end -end view onto how is this actually impacting our business? Are we actually seeing efficiencies? Are we seeing adoption? All of that. So make sure whatever you, whatever you look at that's either API-based um, or you, you're pumping it into another system that's a BI tool that again, can give you that, that full picture. So lastly, um, not pitching too much here, but this is why we built Fresh Service. We wanna make it intelligent and right size and have that low total cost of ownership, make it easy to use. That's one of the reasons uh, we've moved up into the Challenger uh, Magic Quadrant for Gardner is because we, we, we found the right, uh, I guess you could say balance between level of configurability, deep configurability, uh, intuitiveness, built in AI technologies, but while also being delightful and easy to use. Um, I love selling it, I love showing off to customers, everyone's always wowed by it. Um, but if you're interested after this, feel free to email us. Um, Happy to talk some more. And with that, Dick, I turn it over to you. All right. Well, great job, Casey. That was very good. Just to start to start off with, uh, just a little bit more background. Again, my name is Dick Stark, and I've been in this ITSM space for literally years. Uh, we started RightStar in 2003, uh, but before that, I was with another uh, company that I was I was one of the principles in the company. And in other words, we go, we, you know, we go way back. And I've seen a lot of changes over the past few years. I, I remember when we got really excited about some of the tools we'd work in, working with. Actually, you know, back in the 90s, it did have integrated problem change, incident and configuration management. And now we look at that and we say, well, you know, just about anybody uh, should be doing that. Not, not, that, not that everybody is. But now that you've got AISM or you know AI service management, you've got AI ops, you've obviously got chatbots, which is what we've been talking about, and virtual virtual agents. So there's all kinds of new cool things that can really help you improve customer satisfaction, potentially uh, reduce the overall cost uh, of, of of what what you're doing. Uh, just a, a number of things, improve efficiency, which Casey had, had really talked about. So what I want to do is drill down into a university chatbot store. This is a customer of ours. They've been a customer for a long time. Talk a little bit about uh, the objective, you know, how it works and, and, and what the outcome has been. And so if we flip to the next slide, we can get a little bit more background here about this particular school. And the nice thing about this is it's not brand new. They've had this in place for three years. And they did what was really kind of the smart thing to do. They started with just the incoming freshmen. They didn't want to start too big. They wanted to start and pilot this thing for a, a limited amount of time and then roll it out to the entire student body. But when you think about it, a, a university is kind of like a big enterprise, except in, you, you got a fixed number of customers, which are your students. In this case, there was about uh, 26,000 of them. 
And the other thing that makes it a little bit more interesting if you're a school and you know the K-12 schools have to deal with the same issue is that at the start of the school year, there's a tremendous surge. So all, all of a sudden you've got all this work to do you, if you're a, a, on a service desk it, and it just doesn't seem like it's gonna stop. To, you know, you, if, if COVID didn't make it any easier e either. There were things like keeping track of iPads and laptops and, and everything else. And we know we've worked with a number of schools now to know that a lot of those have, have gone missing now as, as a result, because nobody really had any idea who was getting them, where they were, where they were and what to do or how to, how to get them back. But um, anyway, when you think about it, this particular school, like a lot of school, runs business applications. They have things like Microsoft Word, you know, they've got PowerPoint, they might have some Google apps. Uh, they've got a lot of online tools that are out there. They've maybe got some educational applications like Blackboard that's, that's in place. And of course they have collaborate, collaboration tools. Maybe they've got uh, Jira or Confluence, or you know, you know, maybe they have things like Slack or Teams. So there's a number of different things that can go wrong. And then they've got this very demanding student population that comes in and students don't pick up the phone to call. They, they just don't do that. And so if you're a service desk that's set up to get a lot of phone calls, that's not going to happen. What they want to do is they want to try to fix their own problems, either by trying to just hit Google or they want to go to a support portal. Or in this particular case, they want to use their, their cell phone to text the answer. So what was done, and if you roll to the next slide, you can kind of see a, a bird's eye layout of, of exactly what was happened. So you've, you've got a, a student, and then that student could have a laptop, could have their cell phone, maybe they go somewhere and get, get on this, this uh, su support portal. And then from there, they can type in a, in a question. And in, back to this particular case study, what they did is they looked at you know 14 common use cases to, 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 really, to, to, to really just get things up and running. So they thought simple things like what happens if you forget your password and you know, you know a myriad of different systems that you might want to try to access. Well, you know, what happens if your laptop or a device that you're on isn't, isn't working? Maybe, you know, your laptop is, is, has died. What about the Wi-Fi? You know, trying to get up, up on Wi-Fi, you know, it's, it shouldn't be that difficult, but sometimes it, 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 can, it can be. And of course, without Wi-Fi, you know, if you're a, you're a student, you're dead, okay? Um, you know, maybe you can't access a particular database where all your homework assignments are, are or where you're going to put deposit your, your homework. And maybe you just need to get a, a new account or you weren't set up to get on, on, the, on the right account to begin with. So these are some of the case studies that were set up so that what would happen is that a student would type in a particular question and they would get a response. And of course, in this particular case, on the back end, it was powered by IBM Watson, but you could also type in just about it. It was a little bit like having, having Siri there to answer questions for you as well. But in this particular case, the, the organization was, was really established here to, to set up answers to specific IT questions that you might want to, to do. And here you can see some, some examples here, how you would, what the user interface would look like. You could see what uh, particular use case might be if you're trying to get your device registered. And you can see maybe what, what it would look like if you wanted to try to get up on, in this particular case, at SharePoint Online. So a number of different things that uh, really had to fall into place they were able to get this up. We 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 really started the, the project in the the early July timeframe. And of course, the students were going to roll back into town at the end of August. So we were able, just in a short amount of time, to get these use cases up and up and running to a usable form, so that we could roll it out. So, if you want to look at the at the next slide, then we can kind of wrap things up and summarize. Well, what happened then? Well, the the outcome here was 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 very positive. The trial was a success. They were able to answer the questions needs, and then the decision was made after that to roll this out into the entire student population. And so you can see here, it's about seventy thousand tickets per year and about 26,000 students that were served here. And because students uh, <laughs> work 24 by seven, and I, I think I, it, that was a long time ago when, when I was in school, but I seem to remember those days. And if 
the, the service desk, it just can't be up all, all that time. I guess it could be, but it just, it just wouldn't be cost effective. And so the students were able to get these, their questions answered outside of this principal period of support then. And, and I know that was, that's true for university. I think it's true for a lot of organizations. We have another customer that's a very large uh, hospital or healthcare organization, and they've grown through acquisition. And they have because they have all the biomed that's uh, equipment that's set up and, and communicating to the to the service desk. And those that those that equipment can't go down if if you're a critical piece of equipment. So you got to have the help desk set up. But they didn't get that many calls. And so in this particular case, they're they're looking at rolling out chatbots as as well because of the amount of money they will save by turning off the the contractors that have to come in and answer the phone at night and hand that over to, to the particular chat box. So as, as you can see here, it's really about offloading the zero and level zero or level one calls, which frees up the service desk to tackle more of the two level two and three issues. And it, it's not the situation where they're gonna say, okay, well, although lots of schools have, have been really had their budget, budgets hit pretty hard by, by COVID, but I, I don't think that they would be in the position where they're going to say, oh, well, we're going to let people go because we can have the chatbots. Instead, they're going to use those people to do other activities then. Uh, keeping costs uh, in, in control is, is certainly an important thing. Now, you, you, you pay once for this, and like most SaaS-based software, you pay an annu annual fee, and so it's very easy to get a, a very high rate of return on something like this. And then the other thing, the next step would be, you know, what happens next? We've done a good job here. We've talked primarily today, discussion just about managing uh, IT related or IT operations related. Well, what about if you want to roll it out into other groups within the university? It could be maybe there's a finance group. Maybe you need help uh, with your student loan. You know, maybe it's another and maybe it's an HR group and maybe you're now talking with employees of, of the particular university that might need some help. Again, filling out some paperwork. And wouldn't it be not nice to be able to automate that and, and let a virtual agent then complete uh, some of the mundane uh, task of, of putting these phones together. So overall, I'm very excited about what uh, the future lies for uh, A1 and I, I, I try that again for AI and look forward to uh, a particular point in time when you know chatbots or virtual agents are, are just going to be everywhere and uh, people are going to wonder how did I manage uh, without them so with that I, I will we'll turn things uh, back over to Michelle I believe and I think it's time for Q&A yes that was such amazing content Dick and Casey I have learned so much thank you so before we dive into questions, I want to remind everyone that the recording and slides for this session will be emailed to you within 48 hours of the webinar. Also, we will be sending out a feedback survey at the conclusion of this webinar. So help us make our webinars better and tell us what you thought of today. All right, so with our remaining time, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and cover some audience questions. Ooh, here's a good one here. So Karina has an amazing question here, one I want to know the answer to. How can we measure employee satisfaction when our team is dispersed, whether they're remote, in office? Do you have any tips or tricks for that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, if you go back to adoption of AI ML in general, right, what, what was one of the things I really talked about was putting it in the employee journey or uh, with Dick's use case, it'd be the student's journey, right? Put it wherever they're gonna ask, whether it's text or, um, in Slack or, or Teams or uh, a service desk portal, wherever it might be, ask for feedback as soon as it's resolved in that channel. So a great example is in Slack today, we have that what we call Lighthouse uh, bot that works within any channel and I can submit a request and I can get responses back and I can approve requests. And I always ask as soon as I'm done, hey, was this a good interaction? Can we improve? So what I've seen is put it in front of, in front of the employee exactly where they are Number two would be make it easy to answer. So don't add a bunch of survey questions to dig in more and more. Do that on a campaign basis, like every six months or something to all the employee base. Instead, ask a very direct question, make it very simple to answer it with like a, a thumbs up, thumbs down, kind of the Netflix approach when it comes to rating something. Make it easy to give an answer and they're more likely to respond. Uh, we've seen with like a, a binary choice, for example, and one follow-up question, we see response rates at about 35%, which is 
frankly, industry leading. And you just have to keep it going is, yeah. is the thing, because I know that if I ever get asked to do a survey, I usually would say no. I just don't want to fool with it. So make it simple, like Casey said, and continue to follow up because it eventually will get some numbers. Amazing, amazing answer. And thank you for that. I mean, I, I completely agree with it. It's such such a simple, such a simple answer, but so, so helpful here. Let's see. And the next question we have from Chris. He has he has an interesting question here. He says that he has found that sometimes his AI is like using wrong data. And he wants to know, is there any way to ensure that it's using the correct data? So then that when people are asking questions, it's answering them correctly and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I think partially that is based on intent detection, at least that's what we've noticed. And it's partially, again, whatever channel they're in, you can choose, don't, don't just scattershot everything out there. Um, if you think make things a little more intentful, so again, I'll use a Slack example. I keep going back to that. Uh, the type of requests there over time, if you're analyzing this, are going to be a little more transactional than someone going to a service catalog, for example. Um, so you know that you can limit the data set there. So you can train bots. Usually most bots have some kind of training methodology to say, hey, in these channels, I only want to make this subset of actions or data or third-party systems I'm integrated with available for it. And then I'll create some kind of backup flow that says, okay, you're asking something outside the purview of this. I'm gonna drive you to another channel and make it really easy for you to click a link to go to it. So make it intentional, that's, that's part of it. Narrow the focus and scope a little bit based on the channel they're gonna be in uh, and make sure that whatever tool you're using, you have a way to analyze the type of requests that are coming in across those various methods or channels, whatever you wanna call it, um, to better understand which uh, options you should make available. So, yeah. Yeah, make sure you start small and grow because these chatbots are gonna learn as they as they go. And that's why a, I, what I described was a, a sort of a limited uh, implementation would, would be much, much preferred because it's not gonna be as good. It's more like a beta uh, test going on at, at the outset, but it'll get better as time goes by. You know, and we see this too, even with um, uh, customer experience uh, processes and, and, and um, I guess you could say just uh, strategies in general, is if you just throw it out there, either a new channel or AI technology, you just put it all out there and make every option available, it almost never gets used. Um, so like Dick said, start small, maybe it's just in a collaboration channel, a chat channel, maybe it's just via text, whatever. Um, start there, start to measure, let it learn, and then slowly start to walk and then run by adding it as like a back-end RPA process, an agent assist bot, some sort, whatever. Um, I suggest too that whatever technology you look at, you can start small and make sure that you can actually grow with that same one so you don't have to rip it all out halfway through that journey of, of getting to running and uh, implement a new one and start all over from scratch again. Great answer again, guys. Way to, way to team that one up there. Let me see, what do we have next? So our next question we have from Olivia. She wants to know, does it take long and is it difficult to deploy machine learning or AI? I feel like, and in, 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 sorry, Dick, I'm jumping in here first. Um, I feel like, you know, it, it's gonna come down to the solution. Uh, if you look at something like, frankly, Freshworks and Freddy, which was an acquisition called Answer IQ. We purposely bought a solution that would be very um, low code, no code, and easy to pick up and intuitive. Um, we wanted to make it where it didn't require a certified developer or admin uh, to, to implement this and, and work on it over time. And we wanted to feel seamless with the rest of the platform. Um, that's one approach. And I feel like, I feel like in general, that's where most of the industry is going is especially everyone going remote, it's hard to collaborate with people all the time across the world to get something done. So if you can make it as easy, as you make the technology as easy to use, it makes it more likely for you to accomplish your goals. Um, so that's, that's the main approach I see is just ease of use, low total cost of ownership, those type of things. Um, there are other options out there. Uh, IBM Watson, Watson actually is a very, very, very powerful tool. Um, one of the best out there, frankly, in a lot of ways from a technology standpoint. But it requires a little more work training it, plugging it in. Um, they're going for more of the robust, deep, deep, deep configurability and, and um, 
and customizability, but you sacrifice some of that, uh, that ease of use. So it really comes down to what you're looking for. Coming from where I am in the SaaS space, I always suggest go with easy to use, uh, make it delightful for both the admins and the end users. But um, Dickie, I'm not sure if you have any other thoughts on that. Well, time to value, I think, is really one of the most important things that you you could look at. And I, I think in, in some cases, at least on the enterprise level, uh, with large uh, ITSM tool sets, it takes a long time. And we're we're working, we're not the, the lead on this by, by any means. It's a huge systems integrator that uh, we've been working with. And they were given the assignment to roll out and m migrate from one tool set to, a, to another. And they knew that it was going to take at least 12 months. And when you think about it, you know, 12 months, and there's nothing special about what what's happening in the in these 12 12 months process. It's just that it's a big group. There's a lot of different ideas about what direction to to go, and then there's uh, it, it's the old case of well, you, this is how we're doing it. We want to continue to do it this well, and the, the consultancy may say, well, no, you know, we really want you to do it this way, and this is the reason we want to make it more out of the out of the box. And so this back and forth can take up a, a lot of time. And then in the end, you get something that is probably a little bit simpler and not as functional as what you had to begin with. And that mm -hmm. doesn't even count the, the chat bar pot part. That's not even on the table yet. And like I said, you, you just got to sit down and, and do it. And if you give yourself a deadline, like you know, we got to get this up before the students get back, and you work backwards and you think, well, this is what we need to do to get something up that we can turn on and let let the students play with, then you can make it happen. And it's, there's no reason why you should be bogged down by uh, some of these slower process things. And you know that's what ad, Agile is all about, as, as, as a matter of fact. So I, th I think that there's there's real potential to roll these things out and not spend, a, spend an arm and a leg and also not spend a huge amount of time. To, to make this happen. Yeah, Dick, and that kind of ties back to that start small approach too, right? Let's start with, instead of trying to boil the ocean, let's start with something a little smaller, iterate on that, and like you said, use something like an agile methodology so you're continuing to iterate and improve and scale over time and add new functionality, but start with the MVP because you might get a quicker time to value. Exactly, yeah. That is an excellent answer and an excellent point too. I think sometimes we think we have to do everything all at once. And like you said, Casey, you know, a lot of it is about starting with small things and then moving from there and improving as you go along, especially with those feedback loops that you were talking about um, throughout the presentation. Um, our next question here we have from Ryan. He wants to know, is the use of AI and machine learning a feasible option for small businesses with low budgets? And how many team members should he, you know, dedicate to this? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think that kind of ties back to some of the things we were talking about before when it comes with starting small, finding an, e find an easy, in my case, find an easy to use solution that integrates with whatever, whatever solution you're using already. And then like uh, Dick talked about in his, his use case, the more you can deflect those tier zero, tier one, especially calls, another channel and then either deflect them or hyper automate them you're going to get a bunch of savings right there that might make it more palatable to use some kind of ai technology and most of them have efficiency at scales from a costing standpoint whether it's a cost per solve type approach if it's an end user facing uh, bot for example that is typically going to be cheaper than, than the time it takes an actual help desk agent to work on the request and then solve it. So you're going to see savings there and it's a usage based thing. So it's not like you're having to always pay up front for everything. Um, others have it baked into a, a broader ITSM, ITIL aligned solution, kind of like Brushworks where some of the AI just you can use for free and then others you can choose to pay as you use it going forward. So that might be approached and that's one we've seen work for SMBs and um, middle sized companies at, at Brushworks. Or even, you know, a smaller company, it might not have all the bureaucracy or red tape that might be required in, in order to release uh, a, a new tool set out into all the, all the employee network out, out there. And maybe a mid-sized company would be a little bit more relaxed and they might be able to get things up faster and just start, rather than say, we're just gonna start with incident and change or something like that, you may have already graduated to where you're relatively mature and you may just say, with the tool set like uh, from Freshworks, like Fresh Service, it doesn't take that long to get it up and running. And you say, well, why don't we just 
add the, the, the chatbot piece at the same time then, because we're, they're pretty already pretty good at doing basic uh, incident and change management. Why don't we just add this other, other piece on and you know, they could try to sneak it in at the same time, or you might do it as, as the next phase. But I think that would be a, a, a pretty good deal. And you'd, you'd uh, get some savings uh, <laughs> right off the bat instead of having to wait. Thank you guys. That's an excellent answer again. Let our last question here we have from Tom. He wants to know, are there some any common myths about AI and service delivery that you would like to dispel? Oh gosh. We were just kind of talking about the Elon Musk quote before we started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um well, you know, let me just ask that, but 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 uh you, you know, cuz Casey, you made a pretty big point that we're not going to be replacing humans at all yeah. with bots, right? And and that makes some sense because nobody wants to get their job replaced. But uh, Elon Musk used to like to say that we'll be lucky if they only keep us around as pets. So, you know, I don't know where the, where this is going to end, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, that's a good, that's an interesting thought that, you know, none of us may have to work very hard in the future if, if uh, we're going to be just replaced with with bots then. Yeah. I feel like uh, from a myth standpoint, it's, in my experience, it's a lot of, oh, this is very focused on chatbots only, and there's no other value from leveraging AI and ML, um, whereas you don't even have to use that. You could use uh, AI technology specifically for just the hyper automation piece to shorten the time it takes an agent to actually work, work on an issue, so auto triage, next best step, those type of things. Um, we find actually a, a more adoption there because those technologies are easier to train than interacting with an employee or customer where there's more likely, uh, there's a, more, a higher likelihood for frustration from that individual because they don't get the answer they want. And there's a whole Twitter account that all it does is show examples of chatbots completely not understanding the intent of the question and giving just insane out their uh, answers and response. Um, so I think one of the myths is that people think that you only have, can use a chatbot or um, that's really the only approach to improving processes and doing more with less. Um, I find that actually keeping things behind the scenes and, and working with a help desk agent, service desk, whoever, um, and have them leverage the technology sees more adoption um, and as well as is readily accepted more than the employee or customer facing one where, you know, again, there's it's still early on. We'll just say that, like like Dick said, we're nowhere near uh, being replaced, thankfully. Yeah, you know, you know, the one the other thing that I think is important important to uh, take a look at is user adoption. I sat in on a webinar just a week ago, and there were four CIOs, and two of the four said user adoption is is one of the biggest pains that we have to deal with because you may go to all this trouble to implement new processes or a new system, and then all the users say is, you know, we want our old system back, which doesn't really do anybody any good. So one way around that is through, we, 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 have, we offer a different simulation training classes. And if somebody has to sit in on a, on a class and really understand the, the value of, you know, integrated problem change incident, or maybe be the value of a better collabor collaboration, we're not stovepipe or stovepipe together, or maybe even understand how chatbots uh, can, can really, they're, the chatbots are our friends. So they're not something to be worried about. Then I think you'll get higher, um, you know, participation and then acceptance and the, the tool and the new process set that uh, goes with that is going to be a lot more successful. So that's something to, to, to think about as well moving forward. Yeah, great. great, 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 great answer here. Let me see. Hmm. Um, I have a question here from Nicole. She wants to know, um, and this is about the last question that we're going to have time for today. But if you guys do have, you know, any more questions you guys would like to ask Casey and Dick, you guys will be able to just go ahead and message them on um on LinkedIn that you guys see there. Nicole's question is, do you have any experience with AI for project management tasks, mm. slash QA, slash QC reviews, mm -hmm. or on the spot CR, CRM financial analysis? Yeah, uh, that's that's really interesting. So uh, it feels like almost like a seed question, but I promise it's not. Uh, 
it's funny, I just saw our roadmap. We, we uh, at Freshworks are really big into rapid pace of innovation and we have a rolling roadmap every six months and it's very driven by what we see happening in the market, where we see technology going, but also customer feedback. Um, for the, 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 the project management piece, we have a project management module within the broader fresh service ecosystem. Um, and one of the uh, roadmap items for the next uh, six months is actually to start leveraging AI there more. So whether it's defining um, uh, certain types of projects we've recognized or tasks in the past that are usually certain story points, suggesting a, a story point amount to it from an agile methodology standpoint. Um, a couple other items around that, around uh, tying it in with the broader ITSM ecosystem to basically identify potential projects from service requests that are coming in. Um, and then actually we have a full CRM as well, which is the third pillar of our CX, EX, CRM uh, platform strategy. And one of the, the, the biggest drivers or differentiators for it is, frankly, AI within it that basically can identify potential red flags, bottlenecks, potential deals that are actually really hot. You should be chasing those a little bit harder to close them quicker. Um, and that's, again, part of that same end-to-end -end ecosystem, uh, Freddie AI. So it's something we absolutely leverage uh, at Freshworks uh, pretty heavily and feel like it's a game changer for us. Um, across that, I've seen a couple other CRM companies uh, start to look at partners uh, from a from a AI perspective to analyze the data. The, the the downside there is you need to take time for it to train that data model versus something that's pre-built into the platform. So it's just something to uh, keep in mind. Right, and a lot of times a, a lot of this activity is really behind the scenes. Like you might have a project portfolio management tool set and maybe it's it, it, there to help that particular organization scale agile because what ha happens on the team level is not visible necessarily to what's going on at the at the enterprise level in other words how do you figure out what's happening uh, throughout the, the company based upon the work that's being performed and how does that scale to the mission or objectives of the overall organization and that's where bots or at least rpa could certainly help uh, provide the insight that's uh, necessary for an executive or somebody like that to make a critical decision about the success of their engagement that's ongoing right now. Perfect, absolutely perfect. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I want to say thank you to Casey and Dick. You have given us so much information, so much helpful information, great insights into when is the best time to deploy AI. I hope everyone had half as much fun as I did. Thank you to our sponsors, Right Star and Freshworks. And again, thank you, Dick and Casey, and all of you for attending. Thanks for joining us and have a great and productive week. Okay. Thanks, Thanks very much. All right. Yeah, thank so you. long. Take care.